Hey, good morning, church. Most of those who are turning in would, around this time of the morning, be gathered together, but because of the snow and some absences and some sicknesses, we decided that we would uh, do things this way this week, and um, I'm happy to have prepared a sermon for you. We're going to continue back in the book of Mark. Uh, and we've been going through it for over a year now, and we've done the first 10 chapters. There are 16 total. So now, after a brief uh, month or so, taking time to focus on the Advent around Christmas season, uh, and after vacation for me and Heather, well, I'm now back and looking to finish up the last six chapters of the book. So, worth noting is the pace is going to change, both in how much I try to cover per week and how much of a span of time that this gospel covers. Uh, it's very likely, as we see in chapter 11, Jesus approaching Jerusalem, uh, that he was there for about four months uh, before the events of his crucifixion and, and resurrection and all of that. And the plan is, this is just a little bit, a bit of housekeeping stuff before the sermon, I'd like to take just three months to finish the remaining six chapters in the book of Mark in doing that, it will land us at the end of March, Easter, which is March 31st this year, uh, in chapter 16, which discusses the resurrection of Christ. So what a perfect place for us to, to end up. So I'm going to read the passage, and then as we're used to, you don't have to stand if you're at home, but it is a respectful thing to do. I'm going to be reading Mark 11, 1 through 11, and... Uh, then we'll ask God to, um, to bless the, the reading and the study of his word uh, before we continue on and get a little bit deeper into it. So uh, Mark 11, verses 1 through 11 say, uh, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you've entered it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has set. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing, loosing the colt? And they spoke to them, just as Jesus had commanded. So they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it. And he sat on it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it. I just read that. And he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road. And others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Would you join me in prayer? Uh, father, this is a unique arrangement of us um, worshiping this morning. Uh, the worship will be different. We will be without what we're familiar with as far as the corporate gathering of worshiping uh, by giving with tithes and offerings, uh, worshiping through music, worshiping uh, through love and prayer and sacrifice, but uh, we do still have your word. We thank you that we live at a time where each one can have access to your word that's within the sound of my voice. Uh, thank you that even though we're not physically present, that we can be united in our deference to your sovereignty. So I pray that we would show that in actual, effectively real ways this morning as we don't look to read 
into the text, but we look to get out of it what you would uh, have impressed upon us and that you would be glorified as a result and that our lives would be fruitful and a blessing to you in how we consider it and in how we respond to it. Thank you for forgiving us for our sins and for revealing uh, what you have revealed to us, uh, which you were under no obligation to do. I pray that you would bless the consideration of your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to begin by simply reading something out of one of the commentaries that I rely upon to prepare me for these sermons. This one is by R.C. Sproul, and uh, I, I will give you the context that I found interesting. I was considering uh, what might be a sensible segue to take us from where we've been in the last month, which is uh, in consideration of the advent of Jesus, and now as uh, we enter the last six chapters of the book of Mark. So the first paragraph uh, or two of this commentary says, Traditionally, during the Christmas season, many churches celebrate the advent, the coming of Jesus to this world as a baby uh, born to be a king. And that is why angelic greetings came from on high, heralding the birth of a child who was the Savior. This is referenced from Luke 2.11, and we were there for at least two weeks during that Advent series. R.C. continues and says, Some 30 or so years later came the advent of that king into David's royal city. As Mark describes in this passage, we discover here a connection between Jesus' advent into the world to fulfill the kingly prophecies of the Christ child and his advent uh, into Jerusalem. So there's a segue on a silver platter. And this morning, we will be in those 11 verses and probably spending more time on uh, shorter parts of that passage than the longer parts, which... Um, are the substance of, of most of what I just read. So, uh, three things that, the three points, the three considerations that we will get out of this are these, that the king was revealed in humble procession, that the king was revealed to an adoring crowd, and that the king was among a temple of signposts. So, three things, again, that the, the king was revealed in, in humble profession. Excuse me. The king was revealed in humble procession. The king was revealed to an adoring crowd. And the king was among a temple of signposts. So let's get a little bit deeper into that. The king was revealed in humble procession. So much of so this isn't cryptic, what I just read to you. It isn't like the last six chapters of Daniel or much of Ezekiel or any apocalyptic uh, literature. Uh, this is a narrative, what I just read. Uh, you, you should feel well armed if you can read or hear uh, in, in ascertaining most of what you should get out of those 11 verses. It doesn't take a special understanding or training to get most of what you should get out of that. But it is useful for us to consider other things a little bit more deeply so that our understanding of it might be more enhanced. So you can rely a lot on your, on your own uh, in, intelligence and, uh, and, and uh, thoughtfulness in understanding most of what has already been read. Uh, we see here that uh, Jesus w was traveling with the disciples. He sent just two of them and gave them specific instructions on how he should, uh, they should go get this donkey. Now, was this, was this a miracle? Was, uh, I mean, it, you could look at it, uh, if you're a critical reader, and say, is Jesus commissioning them to go steal a donkey? Uh, to which a response could be, well, uh, it was Jesus' donkey in the first place, and everything anybody has is just things that they are stewarding, and all things are God's, but uh, it could 
it could be a possibility that there were arrangements already made with these people that had this donkey that uh, they were holding it for some time until the disciples would come and, and gather it. Regardless of the manner in which that donkey was obtained, uh, one of the more important things is that that donkey allowed uh, and, and Jesus riding on it uh, prophecy to be fulfilled. So we see in the first half of this passage here, it's most of the logistics of, of how to get this uh, Jesus's wheels, so to speak, his, his transportation for revealing himself as king uh, entering Jerusalem. So that takes us right through um, verse 6. So it is roughly half of that passage. And when verse 7 says, and they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. There were practices uh, in in uh, the history of kings w with such things being done with people throwing garments on the ground. Uh, we see here, we, normally this uh, passage is read on Palm Sunday. Uh, other Gospels, I, I believe it's John, talk about this in specificity, these being actual um, actual palm branches that were laid down on the road. Uh, here in Mark, it just says in verse 8, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the field. So they're not terribly specific there in this Gospel about what it is. And it talks about what they were shouting. So what do we want to take from this, okay? Well, here's Jesus as the king. Which king? The the, the king of England? Uh, the king of Iraq? No, the king of, wait for it, kings. The king king. Uh, not just capital K, you'd say capital K, capital I, capital N, capital G. Jesus is the top above which there is no other. Jesus is the authority and he is presenting himself as that king. So think about what you understand from experience. Those who occupy such positions of authority and honor in within political boundaries the president of america but but even ceos of companies let's say let's say celebrities and how they show up to red carpet events let's consider even musicians if you ever come out uh to a rock concert or any genre of music uh there's a big deal made there's uh, amplified sound through a microphone system. There's sometimes smoke machines. And uh, I don't know if I've ever mentioned to you that I'm a Celtics fan. And when the players are marched out at the beginning of the game, uh, the announcer doesn't just say, oh, so here's the guys, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Derek White. No, it's, there's a, there's a, a, gigantic monitor system in the up on the sky in the middle of the court and very very loud music and loud yelling and players jumping around and fireworks and cheerleaders losing their mind that is what we're used to in this world but when we zig jesus zags jesus is we've said this before and this is an understatement jesus is uh, different, okay? And that is a compliment to him. In truth, Jesus is righteous, holy, perfect, and normal, but we are different. All of what we are familiar with in our heart and of the ways that things work in this world what has become normative in our experience is quite ridiculous. Jesus is a humble servant. The God of all might and power and knowledge condescended 
to come to this ridiculous system that we have and serve us. And he does it his way. He doesn't adopt a quote unquote, when in Rome philosophy to be like the people that he's around. Now, certainly God took on flesh, but Jesus came to usher in a new kingdom, a different kingdom, a right kingdom to occupy in the midst of the ridiculousness that we're used to and to change human history. When the rest of the world zigs, Jesus zags. And the manner of this kingly advent that we see in these 11 verses was consistent with the nature of his ministry. Now, why is that important? Okay, so some of you are familiar with, for example, every few years in our worldly culture, uh, there are climate conferences. There's great concern over uh, the identifiable changes in climate and what to do about it. Now, I need to tread carefully here um, because these are triggery issues where people can react rather than think. Uh, it is important. God has given mankind dominion over the world to uh, properly and wisely manage resources that have been put under our control. And uh, the problem is with the way mankind does things oftentimes, and so here's a little bit of rather unavoidable political opinion, there's a lot of bit of posturing and virtue signaling that take place within governments to proclaim intentions to do certain things, to reach certain healthy ends uh, as far as responding to uh, perceived or real environmental crises when in fact the can just keeps getting kicked down the road and many good things are said to, to scratch itching ears of people who are concerned about these things but very little is ever done and one thing that does get noticed about the duplicitous nature of those who seem to have great concern over the climate is that the people that attend these conferences show up largely in private jets, which do uh, exactly what they would say they're concerned that is done badly to the environment, that they're um, contributing to, like I'm not a scientist, but uh, it would be better if there were alternate means of transportation that weren't polluting the air uh, like private aircraft would. Now, I don't have answers as to how they should meet and all of that, but that's one of the things that gets stuck in the craw of people uh, who have a group of people who say they're concerned about one thing, but present themselves in their daily life as not taking the proper precautions to behave in a manner consistent with their declarations of concern. Jesus ain't like that. Jesus came as a humble servant. Jesus came in a manner that was consistent with why he was here, with what his kingdom is about, and what God is about, what Christ is about. Christ came preaching a message of service, forgiveness, humility. Jesus came in the first advent, as we've been over. How humble, how much more humble could you be? than to come as a baby. Babies aren't tall. Babies aren't jacked. Babies don't have a lot of good points to make because they don't even know how to talk. Babies can't mic drop because they can't even hold a microphone and they don't have anything to say. He came in humble means in the first advent. He grew up and roughly 30 years later, here he, he is presenting himself as something he's restrained to do thus far, right? You remember how many times Jesus has done miracles and he's like, boop, 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 keep this between us, okay? The time is not now. It was called oftentimes the messianic secret within Mark, that Jesus was looking to do a slow, calculated rollout of his divinity 
uh, likely because if too much of that information got out too soon, it would expedite the pushback from the world and hasten the timeline. So Jesus knew in perfect timing when this stuff could all be rolled out. Now he decides, I'm going to come in humility on this donkey, pushing back against people's expectations, what they're used to for how kings are normally revealed and paraded out into the world in humility on this donkey approaching Jerusalem. As I said, it was an answer to, it was a fulfillment of prophecy uh, and the Old Testament. If you turn to Zechariah, or just trust me that it's there, but I recommend you turn there to the minor prophet of Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9, which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. There you go. Jesus, uh, as the king, was revealed in humble procession. And Jesus, as the king, was revealed to an adoring crowd. Whether or not this crowd that was, and if we, if we go back to what was read prior in our uh, passage of consideration today, uh, verses, we'll do 9 through 11, which say, And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Yeah, well, that's just verses 9 and 10. That's good for now. The king was revealed to an adoring crowd. Uh, they were referencing passages that they would have been familiar with. We have them here in Psalm 118, verses 25 through 26. And if we had met in person, this would have been our call to worship for today. Uh, those verses say, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Does that not sound familiar? Uh, those declarations from that adoring crowd were cited from Psalm 18, verses 25 and 26, as we understand it. And whether or not they truly knew the nature of Jesus, whether they totally had a grasp on who he actually was, they were motivated for whatever reasons that they had. And of course, just like it is in evaluating churches or any group, groups are uh, assemblies of individuals. And it's hard to describe a group because a group is a whole bunch of people. I would argue it's actually more complicated to describe a group because it's hard enough to understand and describe individuals. And there are so many of those inside a group. Uh, but it is a tendency for us to want to paint with a broad brush and do so. So, you know, this group on the whole, are you tempted to say uh, they were they were in to the Jesus thing? They totally understood what his thing was and they were down with it. Or they had a misunderstanding of who he was in some way or another. But they were celebrating what they thought him to be. And God was gracious in regards to that, even though it was an incomplete understanding. Uh, I will present to you the very likely suggestion that uh, nobody really knew in totality of who he truly was, uh, I would argue with you that you currently don't now. I mean, that there is a degree to which I, as your pastor, and you have whatever understanding you have of Jesus right now, which is sufficient, okay, but growing. We, we know from, um, from Scripture Oh, we do, we do. For now, in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, where Paul says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then, speaking of the future, when we will be with him, uh, he says, and, uh, but then face to face. Now I know in part, he says, even if Paul, who wrote multiple epistles, multiple letters, multiple, multiple, multiple books of the Bible. For now, he says of himself, I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. 
Um, so we're all hopefully growing in our understanding and knowledge of God. And we should honor and respond rightfully at whatever point of that growing understanding that we have. We might also kindly look upon a lot of this crowd as those who might have had misunderstandings. And there probably was a good mix of respectable and not so respectable views that they had of who Jesus was. And what do I base that on? Well, here's just it's the other Gospels talk about this same event here, not just in Mark. Here's John chapter 6, verses 24 uh, through 26. Isn't speaking of this event in particular. Now, what I'm going to read to you right here, you remember, uh, I'm sure you do, that a few weeks ago, probably a few months ago, after Jesus had fed the 5,000, Jesus went away with the disciples. And this group that he had fed noticed he wasn't around. So they went uh, on search and rescue for Jesus. They went to follow Jesus. So here's what John says about that event. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me. I'm going to stop right there. Is it bad to seek Jesus? That's what we're all about in church. We want people to seek Jesus, right? So Jesus identified that they were seeking him. He was probably really psyched about that, right? And respected it. Well, let's see. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me. But because you saw signs. But, oh, he says, not because you saw signs. But... Because you ate your fill of the loaves. Let me read that again. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me. Not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Now, there are a variety of reasons that people come to Jesus. There are a variety of understandings and misunderstandings that people have. And I believe God in his sovereignty can work with very little, uh, with very little of a carrot to draw people to Jesus. And as the scripture says, uh, those who come to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I do believe with conviction that God is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I believe that those who have not found God have not sought God. You might find that infantile or incomplete or superficial. I believe it with my heart. I believe if you want to know God, God will reveal himself to you. We'll talk more on that before we finish this, this study. Uh, but we see here that this adoring crowd, as Jesus revealed himself as king, were celebrating him with a mixture of understanding and misunderstanding. We see, we'll get... You know, spoiler alert, we'll see in the future. There were many in a crowd who seemed fickle and would shout that Barabbas should be released and not Jesus. So uh, there's a lot of things going here with all of the individual understandings and motives of the people in the crowd. But lastly, so we've talked about the, the king being revealed in humble procession. We've talked about the king being revealed to an adoring crowd. And lastly, the king... Uh, being among a temple of signposts. What is that all about? Okay, so this is just the last verse of this passage. Verse 11. Let's read it again. And he entered, speaking of Jesus, and he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So what do we have here? We have Jesus. He had gotten to Jerusalem. He went into the temple. That's significant. And he looked around at everything. In the temple? And it was late. So he went to Bethany with the twelve. It seems like a throwaway verse, doesn't it? It's really quick. There's not a lot of detail in there. Jesus goes into the temple. It's late. So he, he heads back to that roughly two-mile trip back to Bethany with the twelve disciples. Okay? We are told of Jesus entering the temple. But we're left to the direction of the Holy Spirit to consider the significance of that. Think of the temple. What is the temple? It's a place of worship. It's a place where sacrifices were made. It's a 
place where priests were exercising their ministerial activities to bridge the gap between man and God. The, ten- the temple's elements of worship and engagement with God around him were now visited by God himself. Picture this, okay? The scripture doesn't say this, but picture this. Jesus in the temple. All of the elements of worship around him. This structure, the temple, for the work of priests, those whose ministry, as I said, was to manage the gap between uh, common people, common sinful people, and God, was now visited not by just a prophet, but a priest, the great high priest, and the king, the prophet, priest, and king. Colossians 2, uh, by uh, verses 16 and 17 say, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Why do I bring this up? Because Paul there is speaking of different practices uh, that the church was used to understanding when they um, weren't part of the church, but uh, the baggage that came from Judaism and the exalted position that certain activities would have, certain practices, which had value in their lives. But basically, Paul is making the distinction that all of these practices were just shadows. They, They weren't where it's at. Where it's at was the Messiah, was Jesus, was the ministry of God in their lives. And all of these things were useful in as much as they brought people to that. We can find a a fairly responsible analogy in what we've been talking about in Sunday school. For those of us who have been through the group um, study of uh, the John Ortberg book, The The Life You've Always Wanted, which is a book about spiritual disciplines. And, And John Ortberg's position, which I fully agree with, is all of these different Uh, disciplines that we go through, through abstinence or engagement, the things we do or don't do, such as prayer, Bible reading, uh, Sabbath, so many other ones. It's easy for us to make much of any one of those things as an end in itself. And it's very common, somewhat well-intentioned for people in churches to say, I got to read my Bible this morning. Have you read your Bible? And it's great to read your Bible. But there are ways we know from even the Pharisees knowing God's word, which it didn't, it didn't make them more godly. It made them more self-righteous. The goal, John Ortberg says, in these spiritual disciplines is that each of them work, should work towards an end of us growing in our love of God and growing in our love of people. And all of these practices that Paul speaks of here in Colossians, of um, concerns about food and drink and festivals and the honoring of certain days, all of these practices from the elements of the temple, all the sacrifices and all of this stuff, they weren't ends in themselves. The substance of all of that was Jesus and the work of God in redeeming mankind. And here he is in that temple. Picture Jesus as the conductor of a divine orchestra standing in the midst of temple symbols like musical instruments, orchestrating a symphony of fulfillment where each note resonates with the harmonious truth of his ministry. Jesus there was the conductor of an orchestra where all of these instruments were merely instruments, and he was and is, in fact, the song. He is the substance of all of that. So very meaningful that he was there in the temple. And you wonder what might have gone through his mind as he was just looking around, understanding that 
Time was drawing nigh when the fulfillment of many things would take place in his torture and his alienation from God in his crucifixion in his resurrection and in his, his, in his, in his ascension. Uh, the clock was ticking. Mm. So much of this is connected. 66 book in the, books in the Bible, and uh, they're all part of the same story. Many different authors over many different times, through many different cultures. It's all connected. We went through Daniel. Some stuff in there that was hard to understand. Daniel even had a hard time understanding it. Daniel 7, whew, that was a good one. There was some really good, understandable places in Daniel 7. And we've been back here a few times because Daniel speaks at that time, generations and generations ago, of a forthcoming kingdom. He says in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. Ding! And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. It won't expire. Uh, and so that's significant, okay? So the, for the people that knew Daniel and were waiting for generations and generations for this, big deal that Jesus comes in here on a donkey, presenting himself as king, zagging when other worldly powers zig, doing the things how he does them, being consistent with the intentions of his ministry, walking into the temple as the substance of all of these things that were pointing toward him for generations. The, the symbolism, the, the meaningfulness is, is hard to miss. And like we said before, even with the adoring crowd, did they get it? Did they really know, know what this was all about? How about this? The people that were with Jesus, that had seen so much more, that had had front row seats to all of the teaching. The twelve. The disciples. John 12, verses 16 through 17, the Gospel of John, says his disciples, this is in John's retelling of, of this event, of this um, triumphal entry. John says his disciples did not understand these things at first, the significance of, of him riding in and that triumphal entry and the prophecies thereof. So let me just read that without my commentary. It says his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. Uh, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. So there were some people there in that adoring crowd that had heard about or seen the miracle with Lazarus. There were some who got their tummies filled and had followed Jesus because um, um, uh, he, he was a good cook. He could just make stuff on command and prepare it for them. There were a variety of things that brought people to Jesus, the disciples themselves who followed him around and had front row seats. It took a minute for them to figure things out. Didn't quite understand it all at once. We, we've been through this, right? You've ever been your, when you're in your mid-20s and you look at your parents or older generations and man, you've got everything figured out or when you're in your late teens and you don't even know what you don't know. And then at some point, whether you go through certain experiences later in life, things click a little bit more. And sometimes you think back upon your younger life and you might even say out loud what a fool i was what a fool and jesus even called his disciples fools sometimes how foolish generation like you it took a while for people to get things it takes a while for us to get things we can know what we know but not know it all 
So in conclusion, think of this. What was your onboarding to Jesus? And I'm assuming that I'm speaking to people who have been what I call onboarded. Uh, it may be that you are still on the outside of the kingdom of God, and that's a separate discussion. I think mostly I'm speaking to people who have at one point uh, done the thing where they, quote-unquote, invite Jesus into their heart. Um, that isn't a principle that's specifically mentioned in Scripture. It's a church culture thing to help us identify a point in time when we first decided uh, to um, assent to the things of God or, or intend to begin to try to follow God. Uh, and it's a different experience for different people. Some people have a moment and everything changed. Some people have a moment and like me, my testimony is a, it's more of a gradient than it is a quick grinding of the gears and immediate change. Uh, some people come to Jesus because uh, uh, coming to Jesus meant coming to church and maybe even coming to church for a while. They didn't really know who Jesus was, but they got a little bit closer to people of God and heard a little bit more of scripture from being there maybe months or years later uh, something clicked inside them they gained a great enough understanding of who Jesus was uh, for them to begin a relationship with him some people are simply if they believe in hell they're afraid of hell and they onboard that way uh, some people believe um, and rightly so that Jesus will give them peace uh, help them to not worry about things that would otherwise occupy their, their mind and their emotions. It's a variety of reasons that people come to Jesus. Some people come because uh, they're attracted to somebody who's, uh, who's a Christian, and they think, well, I'll fake it till I make it uh, in order to find this uh, boy or girl's heart, and... Uh, Either they find him or they don't. But there's a variety of reasons. And, and if you're sincere, then God, I believe, meets you where you are. Um, but do we know the king that we celebrate? We think of that adoring crowd. Do you know the king that you celebrate? I would challenge you to consider that you do. And you don't. That we all, as Paul did mention, what we read already in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. For we now see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. And now I know in part, and then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Marriage example, which even if you're not married, I think, Perhaps you can understand just from friendships or family relationships that, that you have or had. Uh, I've been married, I think, so, I, so long I don't know exactly the number. It's 27 or 28 years, I think 27. And uh, it's funny, we keep thinking about how my wife and I stood up in front of a pastor and, you know, I said, you want to do this, basically, uh, whether or not you have a lot of money or you don't. Or whether uh, she or he is sick. Or, like when it gets hard, like you, you all down with this? And we were like, yeah, 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 that sounds good. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, I do, I do. We had no clue. We had no clue. We just knew that when we were around each other, our hearts fluttered, and we didn't at that point ever want to not be around each other. And throughout those almost three decades, uh, we've seen more of each other more more deeply and we've still decided every day i'm still in i'm still in but we know in a lot of ways a different person that we're married to now than we did almost three decades ago but we knew enough to knew that know that we wanted to have that relationship same same with jesus i accepted the lord when i was seven my doctrine was not strong back then my knowledge of Jesus was not strong. 
it was Sunday school acceptable. That's where I was. And I celebrated him as the king that he was then. And likely, I hope that you still do now as you've grown in your understanding of Christ. And not just trivial knowledge, but you've walked with him through valleys. You've walked with him through grateful joy over the things that he's provided for you or delivered you from. You have a different relationship with that Christ now than when he first marched into your life and you celebrate him still. I want to encourage you that that Christ that came in his advent as a baby, that he came uh, generations ago in advent uh, as a king into Jerusalem, uh, still is marching into your heart. And uh, you can celebrate him with a growing sense of knowledge of who he is and what he has done for you uh, as you grow in your knowledge of him. So, It's customary for us to pray after a sermon. Let's do that. Father, thank you for recording these events. It's really easy to take for granted that this significant, significant event was recorded uh, for our consideration because it's useful to us. When I think of it myself, uh, it's, it's attractive, particularly when I consider the contrast of what I'm used to, the sickening um, self-exalting manner in which people are paraded in front of other people. Certainly we know, we have been told also that there will come a day when Jesus comes in great power in his second coming. But to come humbly as he did as a servant, to give his, um, his body up for punishment, his relationships up for betrayal, his community, his unity with God to be interrupted as he bore our sin um, was necessary. And I pray that you would help us to appreciate that and to celebrate him for that with our thoughts and behavior. We thank you for the opportunity to ask these things of you in confidence that they will be done because certainly we understand they would be in your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.